Hello, uh, this is the Crito Dialogue. Uh, this nifty little piece of writing is going to set up some of the issues that we're going to be concerned with in some way or other, uh, just about the entire rest of this course in ethics. But first, a little bit of background. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this is a dialogue. It's, it's a conversation between two people, and it's called Crito. Uh, even though Socrates seems to be the major character, you might wonder why not call it Socrates instead of Crito. Um, but uh, Plato wrote lots of these conversations between Socrates and other people, and so usually the, the dialogues are named uh, after who Socrates is talking to, even though Socrates is typically the major character um, in all of these Plato's, uh, Platonic dialogues. Uh, Socrates was an actual historical person. Uh, uh, we know about him mostly through the writings of his students, uh, Plato being the most important of those, but uh, also some others, uh, Xenophon, for example, uh, some of uh, some some ancient Greek drama uh, sort of you know refers to Socrates, uh, you know, a time or two. So uh, again, we know he was an actual historical person, but Socrates himself never wrote anything. Uh, so everything we do know of what Socrates said and did, uh, we get from other people who've written it down, again, mostly Plato. Uh, and so Plato writes, uh, uh, writes this dialogue here, and Socrates is then the major character in it. Uh, in terms of of timeline, uh, Crito and Socrates are having this conversation in Socrates' jail cell. I don't know if the context quite makes that clear uh, from the beginning when I talk about you know bribing the guard to get in and all that stuff, um, and you know death penalties and so. But yeah, the, effectively, like he's 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 being held. You know, uh, Socrates is being held uh, because he has been convicted of a major crime in, in by his fellow Athenians, uh, and that is. Uh, well, a couple of crimes, actually. He was convicted of the crime of corrupting the youth and also uh, of, of religious innovation of various kinds. He was said to have uh, had unconventional beliefs about the gods. Uh, one of his accusers told him, you know, accused him of, of, of being an atheist, uh, and, uh, you know, which Socrates denied. He denied he was an atheist, although I'm sure he probably did have some uh, views about the gods that were uh, a little unconventional at the time. In any case, um, uh, he, he was convicted of these crimes, and uh, typically uh, what happens in one of these kinds of cases is that the people who are bringing the charges, they propose to the, the, all the people who are there, uh, who are eventually just going to vote on, on what to do, uh, they propose a sentence, and the sentences that were proposed were either exile or death. Of course, they thought he'd choose exile, and at the trial, he says, no, I don't, you know, <laughs> I definitely prefer death to exile, I don't want to leave. Um, and uh, actually, he he... he it's it was standard for defendants in these kinds of trials to also offer uh, you know sort of a counter proposal you know it's like well how about instead of that you you know I pay money or I do this or I do that whatever right um, and uh, his proposal was that he be put on the public payroll uh, for the important service that he provides uh, to to the city and uh, I think some people were not amused by that it was very cheeky uh, but in any case uh, he was he was uh, convicted of corrupting youth and and of religious innovation and. Uh, uh, was sentenced to death, and so he's here a day or two away from uh, his death sentence being carried out, uh, and his good friend Crito uh, is has come to to talk to him in his cell. And uh, I think again, most people really would have expected Socrates to flee in this case, and so that's why the conversation is really notable. Um, in fact, this was fairly common in the ancient Greek world, the time in which uh, Socrates is living uh, and that Plato is writing, uh, is that, you know, lots of people sort of made their way getting kicked out of one town or and, and another and just sort of making their way to the next town down the road until uh, they were annoying enough to those people to get kicked out. And, you know, so uh, they, you know, spouted off all kinds of unpopular ideas and opinions and all that sort of thing. And and because that kind of, of, of trade and ideas was so uh, common at the time, it's one of the reasons that Greek intellectual culture of the time was so exceptional that is we still pay attention to it it was so special but hopefully that's uh, that's enough background to uh, to make the the overall context of this exchange uh, make uh, enough sense so let's take a look then at the exchange itself so here's Crito's plan uh, he puts it this way, he says, but my supernatural Socrates, even now, listen to me and be saved. If you die, for me, it won't just be one misfortune. Apart from being separated from the kind of friend, the like of which I will never find again, many people, moreover, who do not know me and you well will think that I could have saved you if I were willing to spend the money, but that I didn't care to. 
and wouldn't this indeed be the most shameful reputation that i would seem to value money above friends for the many will not believe that it was you yourself who refused to leave here even though we were urging you to so the proposal here is that Crito says, look, I've already bribed the guards. I can hire a boat. We can get you out of here. I've got friends in other towns. You know, it, it'll be OK. Right. And so that's effectively what he's doing. He's, and he's saying, just, you know, just think right, of what everyone's going to think of me and your other friends uh, who, who didn't spring you out of here when everybody fully expected that to happen. And so here is going to set up a really important distinction that we're going to end up coming back to quite a number of times throughout the course. And this is a distinction between what you might call prudence, uh, which is doing that which uh, provides your well-being, and uh, morality, that is uh, sort of doing the right thing. So this, this distinction between prudence and morality is one that, uh, that, that we're, we're going to be revisiting uh, here and there. And so if we just look at this situation uh, from, you know, from from a modern point of view or really any point of view i think just about everybody views the the basic uh setup here as involving a kind of a conflict right so in terms of prudence i think it's some very in some very obvious ways it's it's better for socrates if he takes crito's offer and flees right uh, for the most part we're like ah it's better to live than to die <laughs> right uh, i mean the, the the judgment against socrates was was bogus for the most part uh you know the athenians made a, a big mistake and and you know plato never lost an opportunity to sort of rub their noses in it um and you know there's it's just you know he he can he can teach other people he can you know continue to have 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 a life and yeah he's an old person but still you know he's not gonna you know he shouldn't give up his life right so it seems like in in a lot of ways it's good for Socrates if he takes uh, Crito's offer escapes goes on with his life right but there's also this sense of obligation of justice right of of uh, you know sort of following the law of of you know sort of sticking to your principles even if they get you in trouble that sort of thing and uh, this is the kind of uh, thing that that involves morality that is sort of doing the right thing right doing that which is right and socrates is going to try and convince crito that it's in fact the moral thing to do to stay even if it might be the prudent thing uh, to leave and so we're going to see a lot of conflict between prudence and morality throughout the course uh, and it's going to be a recurring question of, of what the real relationship between prudence and morality is or what you're supposed to do when these two things do conflict with each other. And so, uh, ironically enough, Crito, who's trying to convince Socrates to choose prudence over morality, uh, himself, in, in this uh, little paragraph here, places morality over prudence. He says, he says, you're not worried, are you, about me and your other friends, how if you were to leave here, the informers would make trouble for us because we stole you away from here, and then we would be compelled either to give up all our property or a good deal of money or suffer some other punishment at their hands. Uh, I mean, really... Uh, even you know to this day if you if you help someone escape from prison you you've committed a crime you're liable you could be punished for that that's that's you know and so that's that's what uh, 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 uh crito here is saying he's like he's like look don't worry about that we're all willing to go through that right he says if you have any such fear let it go because it is our obligation to run the risk in saving you even uh and, and even greater ones if necessary so trust me and do not refuse right um no, it is our obligation, right? In effect, what he's saying is he's saying that, you know, even if it's not good for us, right, even if it's not prudent of us to help you in this case, um, it's it's moral. It's the right thing to do. That's, that's sort of uh, what he seems to be implying. Uh, and so uh, he's going to run into a little bit of trouble making that implication because Socrates is going to use that very uh, commitment of morality over prudence uh, to end up uh, uh, refusing Crito's offer. So Crito uh, uh, doesn't stop there. He, he doesn't just, you know, uh, 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 stop with, you know, saying, don't worry about what happens to us. He, he, he has a, a, a couple of positive arguments uh, in favor of, of Socrates uh, saving his own life, right, uh, that go above and beyond just Socrates' own personal well-being. Uh, in fact, he, he delineates them here. He says, what's more, Socrates, what you are doing doesn't seem right to me. Giving yourself up when you could be saved, ready to have happen to you what your enemies would urge and did urge in their wish to destroy you. I also think 
You are betraying your sons, whom you could raise and educate, by going away and abandoning them. And as far as you are concerned, they can experience whatever happens to come their way, when it's likely that, as orphans, they'll get the usual orphan's treatment. One should either not have children or ensure, endure the hardship of raising and educating them. But it looks to me as though you are taking the laziest path, whereas you must choose a path, a, 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 a the path a good and brave man would shoot, especially when you keep saying that you care about virtue your whole life long. Okay, yeah. So uh, um, this is uh, again these, this is the terms in which Crito phrases his moral argument. He phrases them in terms of character traits, which is uh, again very common of, of uh, ancient writing. Uh, and he mentions uh, Socrates' children, although you might be a little confused. You're like, but didn't it say uh, uh, in in this dialogue, doesn't Socrates say he's a really old guy, right? You know, it's like, how old is he? Does he is he just joking? Is he like 40 and he's not that old or whatever? Uh, no, he is actually, he's quite old. Uh, he's We estimate he's around 70 years old by the time this happens. And uh, so you're like, you know, what 70-year-old has, has small children? Uh, it turns out that... If, Again, there, there's, there are th things we do know and things we don't know about the historical Socrates, and his family life is not something we know a great deal about. Uh, but uh, apparently his wife was possibly as young as 40 years younger than he was, and so uh, he did have uh, – they, they were young children. There are three of them. I had three sons. It doesn't mention daughters one way or the other um, because, you know, it's ancient Greek writing, um, and that's, you know, part and parcel of that. But in any case uh, – the, uh, the 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 children are are young at this time, even though uh, Socrates himself is quite old. Um, so Crito continues. He says, "So I'm ashamed, both on your behalf and on behalf of your friends, that this whole affair surrounding you will be thought to have happened due to some cowardice on our part." Right? The hearing of the charge in court that it came to trial when it need not have, the legal contest itself, how it was carried on as the absurd part of the affair that by some boldness and badness and cowardice on our part, we will be thought to have let this final act get away from us since we did not save you nor you save yourself when it was possible and when we could have done so if we were of the slightest use. And so he also says, look, that, you know, it was a farce of a trial. Everybody knows it was a farce of a trial and, uh, you know, that you were not, you know, really a bad bad guy and that you know we'd be we'd be the useless ones if we let you just sort of perish on account of this right so that's essentially his argument he says he's, they think of our reputations think of your children um and uh, i mean these are this is these are reasonable pleas right they're the sort of things you imagine somebody really would listen to and so Socrates is going to deal with these things more or less one at a time. And I've taken this text ever so slightly out of order just to, for, for organization's sake. The whole text really is worth uh, a read. This is, this is you know, just a handy recap uh, because I want to focus on some of the larger scale issues. Uh, but but in terms of reputation, Socrates, you know, in a quick Q&A, uh, addresses the issue, right? Socrates says, look, is it fair enough to say that one should not value every human opinion, but only some and not others, and not the opinions of everyone, but of some and not others? What do you say? Isn't this right? And Crito agrees. He says, yeah, you shouldn't listen to everybody. Uh, again, I think we'd agree with Crito. Yeah, you shouldn't listen to everybody. Uh, Socrates says, well, shouldn't we value the good opinions and not the worthless ones? And Crito again agrees. It's a pretty easy question to answer. Um, Socrates' questions are mostly easy to answer, and then usually what happens is you end up in a place you didn't necessarily think you were going to end up. Socrates says, then, aren't the good ones the opinions of the wise, while the worthless ones come from the ignorant? Crito is like, of course. And so the upshot of this is that he says, look, uh, I shouldn't care about your reputations, and neither should you, right? You should care only about what people who really know what they're think what they what they're talking about think of you, uh, and that's not very many people. Uh, and so, you know, so, so certainly reputation, uh, either Socrates's or Socrates' friends' uh, reputations, is not going to be a major issue. It's not going to be the thing that that should make uh, anyone make decisions. Good good advice, uh, even to this day. Ah, now, now for the, the matter of his children, right? So uh, here's how he addresses it. He says, look, is it for the sake of your children that you want to live so that you can raise and educate them? Um, what are you going to do in that case? Socrates, in some sense, he's he's personifying the laws, talking to him, which is why he's using this you. He's referring to himself as you, right? So he's imagining the laws asking him questions. That, 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 there's a lot of this uh, 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 throughout the dialogue there. And so he says, you'll raise and educate them by bringing them to Thessaly and making them outsiders so that they'll can enjoy that benefit too? Or if not that, will they grow up better if they're raised and educated with you away from them but alive because your friends will take care of them 
But is it that if you go to Thessaly, they'll look after them? That is, his friends will look after the boys. Whereas if you go to Hades, they won't? <laughs> uh, if, if those who claim to be your friends are any good, you must believe they will. Right? And so this is the way that he rejects the notion that it's actually better for his children if he if he flees. Right. So so he's like, what are my choices here? I could leave them here and then they're going to be raised by my friends, essentially. Um, uh, and, and he says that would be sort of fine, which is exactly what happened if I died. That is, you know, sort of went to Hades. Right. And uh, he says, or I could take them with me if I fled. But then I'd just be turning them into exiles, too. Uh, and if I didn't think that was any good for me, why would I think that would be any good for my children? Uh, and so, so that's essentially the way he addresses that issue. But his main issue here, uh, and the one that's mostly, uh, you'll, you'll notice in the dialogue, is the, the main, main issue uh, is this notion of essentially morality, of the right thing to do, of, of justice, right? Um, and again, this is part of this long uh, uh, sequence where, where, where Socrates is imagining the laws, like asking him questions, right? And, and sort of grilling him just exactly the way that he sort of does, does the same thing with Crito, sort of asks him questions to try and say, look, don't you really think, you know? Uh, etc. So, uh, so, so, so this part of the conversation goes this way, right? You know, aren't you, the laws might say, going against your contracts and agreements with us, which you were not forced to agree to, nor deceived about, nor compelled to decide upon in a short time, but over 70 years, in which time you could have gone away if we did not satisfy you, and these agreements did not appear just to you. Now then, won't you keep to what you agreed, right? Um, you know, keeping one's promises is, you know, in the ancient world and in, in the pre-ancient world and the modern world, it, it's a core of moral behavior, uh, keeping to one's agreements. And Socrates has said, you know, here he, he's agreed to follow the laws. He's agreed uh, to live in the city. And, 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 you know, he wasn't ever deceived about it. He wasn't coerced into it. He could have left at any time. Right. But, you know, he says, he says so there's something to this, this uh, sense of keeping agreements. Uh, the next paragraph, just think about what good it will do you and your friends if you break the laws and do wrong in one of these these ways. It's pretty clear that your friends will risk exile along with you and disenfranchisement from the city and confiscation of their property. And you will confirm the opinion of the judges so that they will think they judged the case correctly, since whoever is a destroyer of the laws would certainly be considered in some way a destroyer of young and foolish men. Remember, the crime that Socrates was convicted of, or one of them, was corrupting the youth. And so uh, Socrates is implying here is like, look, if you leave, right, if you sort of abandon morality here just because, just to save your skin, uh, then then you really will be corrupting the youth. Like all your friends, who many of his friends were much younger men, um, you know, he's like, you, you really will be corrupting your friends uh, if uh, if you, you know, sort of abandon all uh, morality and justice and, and flee the city uh, at uh, at this time. So it's a very interesting and very sort of, a, you know, poignant argument. And uh, I just want you to reflect a minute on the kind of character, right, of, of the sort of person uh, who could really hold up uh, their their character in, you know, to, even at the cost of their own life. But Socrates is going to suggest something here that is going to be really important uh, throughout uh, the course. He's going to suggest that that perhaps uh, doing the right thing is is also the thing that makes uh, that is is the best thing for him. It is in his best interest. Uh, you wouldn't think so. He's like you know like look how is dying in your best interest? But he says well he puts it this way. He says and is life worth living after the part of us which injustice injures and justice benefits has been corrupted? So examine again whether or not it still holds true for you that it's not living that should be our priority, but living well. Right, so Socrates here does make the suggestion that um, apart from there being a conflict between prudence and morality in this case, that really they're one and the same thing. Um, that uh, being moral uh, makes a person's life better for them, 
right? Even if in other ways it would seem like it would be in their interests not to be moral. This is a contentious point. This is a point uh, over which people will argue for the next two and a half thousand years and, and uh, you know, the foreseeable future as well. Uh, it's a very, very difficult question. It's one of the difficult questions of ethics. To what extent is our own self-interest and morality the same? To what extent are they different? What kind of conflicts are there between the two? And so in this course, we're going to be taking a look at two different kinds of, of theories. They, they both count as a part of the study of ethics, uh, but they are very, very different things and should be sort of kept separate. Uh, one of these is, is discussion of theories of well-being. And that's one of the things that we're going to start uh, the course with. So this particular unit is going to concern theories of well-being. And then after that, we're going to turn to theories of morality. And most of the course will be taking a look then, uh, most of the rest of the course will be taking a look at theories of morality. Uh, so theories of well-being are trying to say, okay, are trying to answer the question, what makes a life a good one for the person that lives it? Right. So what is what is prudent for that person to do? Like what actually serves their interest? What is good for them? Right. Uh, uh, and maybe it's pleasures. Right. So that, that uh, all else being equal, the, the life that has more ple the most pleasure in it is the best one. OK, that's that's one possible answer. Um, it might there another possible answer uh, is desire satisfaction is maybe the life that has more of its desire satisfied is better than one that has less. Um, uh, perhaps virtue, right? Uh, having having right character is what actually makes a life a good one for the person that lives it. Um, you know, and 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 there will be some other answers besides that we'll end up taking a look at. But again, these are all theories of well-being. They're theories of what makes a life a good one for the person that lives it. That's very very different from a theory of morality. Uh, that is, uh, the theory of morality is, is is asking the question: What is the right thing to do? Or what is the right way to be? And so if you want a, a much more extensive breakdown of this question, uh, see the, the video, the map of moral theory. That's that's going to sort of tie in right here where you get sort of a breakdown of a lot of different ways of answering those questions. Um, and so we're going to be taking a look at some bad answers to that question so that we can set them aside. We'll be taking a look at some very good answers to that question uh, uh, and, and some of the issues with some of those very good answers. Uh, and, and that's, again, going to be much of the course. But but keep in mind, it's very, very important. Well-being and morality are not necessarily the same thing. Those are two very different theories. So, for example, hedonism is a theory of well-being, not a theory of morality. It tells you what would make a life a good one for the person who lived it. It does not tell anybody what the right thing to do is. Right. And you might say, well, isn't the right thing to do the thing that is good for you? Well, that's that that's a moral theory. That's a moral theory called uh, egoism. Uh, and uh, it's actually quite a crummy moral theory uh, because it doesn't involve enough. Well, morality. Right. It's it's uh, um, but, it, you know, in itself, it doesn't also involve the theory of well-being. So, uh, yeah, for example, you know, hedonism, desire, satisfaction. These are theories of well-being. They're not theories of morality. Utilitarianism, Kant's moral theory, Ross's moral theory, these are theories of morality. Um, uh, they're not theories of well-being. They're not theories that tell you what makes a life a good one. They're theories about what you ought to do. Okay, so the, again, very, very important distinction, one of the big reasons for bringing uh, this dialogue up. And so we're going to see a, a lot of different proposals about the relations between well-being and morality, right? There are very different things, but there's some relationship between them. Uh, and one of the possible relationships is a, a very common ancient view. It's expressed here in this dialogue by Socrates a couple slides ago. Uh, and it's also later going to be expressed by Aristotle when we talk about virtue ethics. And the proposal is that being moral, that is being virtuous, is the best life for the one who lives it. So that, that in that case, there would be no conflict between prudence and morality. If you say, well, you know, why should I be moral? The answer is, is obvious. It's like, well, because that's also, that's the, not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also the best life for you. Um, whereas later thinkers uh, have, have tended to, to doubt that connection. Uh, so for example, utilitarians uh, will end up claiming that morality is entirely about well-being, just not necessarily your well-being. Uh, so uh, their claim is that you should do what results in the greatest overall well-being, even if it's not beneficial to you in particular. 
And so that sometimes, right, prudence and morality will conflict, sometimes it won't. Uh, but when it does, you should choose morality, right? That's going to be the utilitarian line. Uh, another uh, very important moral thinker we'll spend some time on in this course, uh, Immanuel Kant, he'll claim that well-being is totally irrelevant to morality, no matter whose well-being it is. Uh, he's going to say that's just not the point. It's entirely beside the point. What makes something right or wrong doesn't really have anything to do with who it benefits or not. Uh, and it's, again, a very compelling and interesting view. Uh, and in his view, morality is, is the most important thing, but moral acts don't necessarily benefit anyone. They don't necessarily harm anyone either, but they, 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 is it the benefit or the harm? Is it, it's just not, that's just not the point, right? And so in this case, prudence is just not necessarily immoral. It's just not relevant to morality. And so we're going to take a look at, at sort of all of those kinds of issues. Uh, but the important thing for right now is to keep in mind the difference between a theory of well-being and a theory of morality, right? They are very, they're trying to answer very, very different questions.